knowing ourself is part of knowing God. And so drawing close to God is drawing close to ourselves. What do I think and how do I feel? So in today's message, I invite you to know yourself. And here's why. Being yourself starts with knowing yourself. I can't be myself if I don't know who I am. Knowing yourself is key to being emotionally mature and to be spir being spiritually mature and relating well to others and to God is best possible if you know yourself. Because you see, you are not what other people think of you. You are not what you have. You are not what you do. You are not someone else. You are you. And that's important. Oscar Wilde famously said, be yourself. Everyone else is already taken. True. Pete Scazzaro, the author of this book that we're studying in our small groups from now until the end of the year, said, the vast majority of us go to our graves without knowing who we are. We unconsciously live someone else's life, or at least someone else's expectations for us. This does violence to ourselves, to our relationship with God, and ultimately to others. Dallas Willard is a famous philosopher, a professor at UCLA in the United States, and an author. And he says, we are unceasing spiritual beings with an eternal destiny in God's universe. Wow. That means we're pretty important. You are important. You, not the one sitting next to you, you are important. And Saint Irenaeus in the second century, so like thousands of years ago, said something that has uh, uh, captured my attention since the very first time I heard it. The glory of God is man fully alive. The glory of God, God's best gift, is a person who is fully alive. What does that mean? To be fully alive is to be complete, to be whole, to be connected with yourself on the inside, to live without contradictions. I'm the same person inside as I am outside. I'm the same person in my thoughts and in my actions. That means I need to know what I like and what I dislike, what I feel, what I think, what I prefer. And that is how I glorify God. That is how I give God a good reputation. That's what Jesus did. He was completely himself. Think about it. Think about the stories that you've heard about Jesus. He was always himself. He was always the same person. He wasn't afraid to speak the truth. He wasn't afraid to pay attention to the ones who were the least in the group. He knew himself, and by being himself, he helped others to want to know God, to want to know themselves. So why don't we know ourselves? What are the obstacles that we face in our world today that keep us from knowing ourselves? Well, I was thinking about it for a long time, and I asked for some help, and I came up with eight reasons to why don't we know ourselves. First one, we think we do. We actually already think we do know ourselves. We don't know that we don't know. 
We only know ourselves through the eyes of others, which may not be really us. We may be afraid of what we might find. So it's better not to go there. Or we don't think it's important. We have other better things to do with our time. We're very busy people. We need to keep on going. Or we just think it's too difficult. Ah, I can't do that. I don't even know where to start. Poor guy, right? No, I can't do this. (laughs) Or maybe we wish to be someone that we're actually not because we've compared ourselves to other people or because we have have watched so many movies and we have an idea of what we want to be. Andres Corrales, who spoke last week, shared with us the difficulty of being the youngest of five and always trying to live up to and to meet the expectations of his older brothers. Maybe we want to be who others want or need us to be. No, I can't really be myself. I can't say that thing because my grandmother or my mother or my boyfriend or somebody won't like that. Or maybe we just don't know how. So welcome to Christ Church this morning where we're going to talk about how we can meet ourselves or how we can know ourselves. Whichever of these you identified with, maybe one, maybe more than one, whichever one, I invite you on a journey, a journey in to yourself. What I believe is the most important thing about me. If I believe I can't, Even if I actually have very much ability, I may not be able to accomplish it. So there are two dynamics that go on inside us. One is the true self, who we actually are on the inside. And the other is the false self, who we think we should be or who we want to be or who other people tell us we are or who we believe we are that is not actually who we are on the inside. The true self is what is true about me when no one's looking. Who are you when you're all alone and no one's looking? What do you think and what do you feel? The part of me that is me, my likes, my dislikes, my preferences, my thoughts, my feelings, my perspective, the part of me there where there is no contradiction. And then there is the false self, Or another way of saying our ego, the external part of myself that I show others, the adaptations that I make to be liked, to be accepted, to fit in. I looked up a definition of false self, and it says it's a sense of self created as a defensive facade, which in extreme cases can leave an individual lacking spontaneity and feeling dead and empty behind an inconsistent and incompetent appearance of being real. This is often the Facebook or Instagram self, right? The part that we like to show other people. And what about the rest of us on the inside? We're all born into a family. We've all been born into a human family, which means we all have imperfect parents, imperfect family. None of us comes from the top, most perfect kind of family. We learn who we are as children as we're growing up through the eyes of other people. Think about it. You can't see you in this moment, right? I can see Alejandro. Alejandro can see me, but I'm me. I'm looking out from inside me at all of you. So I don't know how I look from the outside, I only know how I look from my inside. So we learn who we are as we're growing up through the eyes of other people, 
through the words and the actions of other people. There are two problems with this. One is, so much of communication is negative. So much of the things that we say is ne- are negative. We keep the positive inside naturally as human beings, and we say the negative. Second problem is, we don't have time or awareness to check out our assumptions. Wait, did you just think that I was stupid for saying that? We don't usually take the time or even have the awareness to ask that question, right? And less as little children. So, for example, growing up, our mothers might have said, sit up straight, don't be a slouch. You know, we walk around like this when we're teenagers, stand up straight, get your posture right. You know, that's a correction. Okay, another thing, don't answer me like that, you smart aleck. What message do I receive? Why didn't you make your bed again? Such a slob. Now, maybe the second part of these phrases weren't said, but this is what the message is behind the expression. Will you stop fighting? You're such a pest. Or the other extreme could happen. My child, my child is perfect. My child should win all the prizes. Actually, why didn't that teacher give my child the prize? I'm going to go talk to that teacher. And I've had a a few friends who've said, I was so embarrassed because I knew the other student was actually better than me. But my mother was sure that I should have earned the prize and went and talked to the teacher. The overdone positivity creates confusion and insecurity in a child, just like the negative messages. Our fathers might have said, I can't believe you didn't do that. What's your problem? Can't you hear? Or, I got bad news from school. You never pay attention. Or, please, just leave me alone. Maybe our mothers or fathers were just absent emotionally, not making time for the deep questions of our hearts, leaving us lonely or abandoned. What conclusions does a child come to when they hear these kinds of phrases throughout their life? Then there are siblings and friends, teachers, classmates, coaches, grandparents, and events. And many times the negative messages just get piled on and on and on. Now, in terms of messages about me, some are true. Some have to do with my true self. I'm not perfect either. Some are true. Some are negative. Some are positive. But many of the messages that we receive are false. The problem is we don't distinguish between those. It's not only what was said. It's how I process or interpret internally what was said. And all of this begins to create that self. Many of our parents did not intend to do us damage. They did the best they could. They loved us. They probably did better than their parents. So this is not about blame, but it's about self evaluation. It's about learning about ourself. Who am I? What is my true self? We learn from all communication. Actually, uh, psychologists say that 70% of communication is not the words. Imagine, 70%. So what message did we receive through the tone of voice, through the facial expression? through the silence, through body posture. As we learn through the communication of others, we also know instinctively who we are. We know what we like, 
and what we don't like. We know how we feel. We know what we're good at and what we're not good at. We know if it's true that we're good at math or if not true that we're good at math. Now we hear things, and I'm going to show you an illustration. We hear things about ourselves that are also negative and not true. Like, you're so slow. Or what a mess. Why can't you just understand? Why would you choose that ugly dress? Things like that. But since significant people in our lives say them, or since they've been said over and over again, we begin to believe these things. And this creates a false self. And look what happens. This is my true self. And this is my false self. The more distance between my true self and my false self there is, the more pressure. This microphone, the more pressure I live under. And this rubber band just might snap. And the problem is, I grow up like this, and so I'm living with this pressure, and I don't even know, because it's normal, because it's part of my life. We're used to it. We feel it, but we don't know it. And chemically, this is what happens in our brain. When we receive positive communication from others, our brain releases dopamine. That's a chemical, which provides a sense of elation, increases adrenaline, and makes us feel very confident and positive about a given circumstance. When we receive negative communication, from others, a chemical, a chemical called cortisol is released instead, which is reserved for uncomfortable or threatening situations. Put simply, dopamine encourages us to relish the experience, while cortisol put, pushes us on edge, generates anxiety, triggers warning signs, and urges us to escape. So what kind of atmosphere did you grow up in? Did you enjoy a safe, positive, true, dopamine-rich childhood? Or was it, rather, characterized by anxiety, false messages, and a desire to escape, a desire to not be there. We are no longer children. Our joy as adults is to learn to be our true selves. No matter what our childhood experiences were like, we can discover ourselves, we can learn to be ourselves, and we can love being ourselves. And we can make ourselves known to the people around us. We can discover and use our voice. We have a right to express our unique perspective, our opinions, our thoughts, our feelings. That is what being ourself is. Now, Jesus said, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that you might have life and have it to the full. The enemy, the thief's purpose is to sabotage our true selves, to annihilate our true self so that we only live as a shell. Remember that picture? We only live as a shell of ourselves. One, he, the enemy wants to steal and kill and destroy who we were meant by God to be. And he does this causing us to live according to these lies, to this false self that has been constructed. And this happens through the harmfulness, the sin of other people, or through negative traumatic experiences, usually, though not exclusively, in childhood. 
That way, we end up sabotaging ourselves because we believe things about ourselves that are not true. Or we don't believe things about ourselves that are true. We can actually believe that our false self is our true self. Look what Pete Scazzaro says in his book. At times, our false self has become such a part of who we are that we don't even realize it. The consequences, fear, self-protection, possessiveness, manipulation, self-destructive tendencies, self-promotion, self-indulgence, and a need to distinguish ourselves from others, those are harder to hide. What I believe is the most important thing about me. If I believe I can't, I probably won't be able to. And maybe believing I can't is part of that false self. I've got to find out what's my true self, what's really true about me. If I believe I should do something, even if I don't have the ability, I might keep trying and trying and trying and not make it and wonder what's going on. So what do you believe? What have others told you? about you? What do your fears say? The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come, says Jesus, that you may have life and have it to the full. Jesus came for us to have a full life, to draw us closer to ourselves, to our true selves, where there is no contradiction. Closer to God, closer to ourselves, closer to God, because these things go together. We will know the truth, and the truth will set us free. Look what it says in the book of Ephesians. You were taught with regard to your former way of life, to put off your old or your false self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new or the true self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. So how do I put on the true self? I'm going to take a minute of silence because that's the first way, is listening to ourselves. And during this minute of silence, I want you to notice, without, obs- without judgment, just observation, what are you thinking? What are you feeling? And what's happening in your body. Our bodies know our feelings often before our minds. So listen to your body too. How's your heart rate? How's your breathing? Where is the tension in your body in this moment? Our thoughts and our feelings are part of our uniqueness. Our body is part of our uniqueness, actually. Nobody else looks like me. Nobody else looks like you. We are all unique human beings. It's incredible. Our thoughts and our feelings are part of the way that God speaks to us. 
If we don't express them, we become like robots going through the motions of life as less than human. And so I invite you to know yourself. Such an important part of growing up to be emotionally and spiritually mature. First, how? First, pay attention to yourself. Just like we did in this, these 30 seconds of silence, pay attention to yourself. What are you thinking? What do you actually feel? How's your body? I've had a cold this, this week. What does that say about me? What are my reactions? What are my fears? I encourage you to start the discipline, if you haven't already, of journaling. Start writing things down. Write down. Because writing untangles our thoughts. And little by little, we begin to understand ourselves more as we write and then as we reread what we write. Hopefully, you can write in a journal every day. But do anything just to get started. Second, find trusted companions. Others who have the same intention, others who want to do the same thing. There is nothing better than journeying with someone else. We are not intended to do life alone. So find others. I'm sure that here in this church, there are other people who have the same intentions as you, who want to embark on this journey together. Third, move out of your comfort zone. Pete Scazzaro says in his book about himself the following, the pain of living a life that was not God's for me finally became greater than the pain of changing. It is hard to change. It's much easier to just keep doing the same thing that we've always done. But that's not going to help us grow. That's not going to help us learn who our true self really is, who we were meant and designed by God to be. So move out of your comfort zone. And fourth, pray. Pray for courage. Because it's not easy. It's possible that the people around you will resist the changes that you're starting to make. Oh, why are you being like that? I wish you were the way you used to be. Knowing and being yourself will bring much fruit in your life and joy to your life in a way that you can't imagine. There are two coexisting truths about us. One, we are such a small part of God's big world. This world is huge. There are so many people that live all around the world in every different culture. And this world has existed for so many years. And so there are so many people in so many generations. We are such a small part. One of my favorite songs called Who Am I by Casting Crowns quotes scripture and says, I'm a flower quickly fading here today and gone tomorrow. I'm a wave tossed in the ocean. I'm a vapor in the wind. And yes, that's true about us. But at the same time, I am and you are important. Because there's no one else in the world like you. We need to be ourselves. Everyone else is already taken. (laughs) Every moment in our life is important. An author called Thomas Merton, a great thinker from the last generation, says this, Every moment of every event 
of every man's life on earth plants something in his soul. For just as the wind carries thousands of winged seeds, so each moment brings with it germs of spiritual vitality that come to rest imperceptibly in the minds and hearts of men. Most of these unnumbered seeds perish and are lost because men are not prepared to receive them. This quote goes for women, too. So let me read it again. Every moment of every event of every woman's life on earth plants something in her soul. For just as the wind carries thousands of winged seeds, so each moment brings with it germs of spiritual vitality that come to rest imperceptibly in the minds and hearts of women. Most of these unnumbered seeds perish and are lost because women are not prepared to receive them. If we are fully alive, if we know ourselves, our true selves, we will be able, we will be better able to receive those seeds and to be and to become everything God has intended for us. God has made us as we are, when and where we are, with purposes in mind. We have each been born into a family, a generation, a country, a culture, as a unique self. We all have gifts and abilities, physical features, interests, thoughts, feelings, all of this makes us unique. And all of it is useful, purposeful, and fulfilling for us. I got a card on my birthday a few weeks ago, and it illustrates so well this point. The card says, on this day, when you celebrate your birth, you're not the only one who is celebrating. God is rejoicing over your life because you are his special creation. He loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. That's a spiritual truth. All spiritual truth, all truth leads us to God. And God is all truth. Jesus promises, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. In closing, I want to read a special description of what freedom looks like. It's from the Bible, but it's a different way of saying it. What happens when we live God's way? He brings gifts into our lives, much the same way fruit appears in an orchard. Things like affection for others, exuberance about life, serenity. We develop a willingness to stick with things, a sense of compassion in the heart, and a conviction that a basic holiness permeates things and people. We find ourselves involved in loyal commitments, not needing to force our way in life, able to marshal and direct our energies wisely. Legalism, or that false self, is helpless in bringing this about. It only gets in the way. Among those who belong to Christ, Everything connected with getting our own way and mindlessly responding to what everyone else calls necessities is killed off for good, crucified. Since this is the kind of life we have chosen, the life of the Spirit, let us make sure that we do not just hold it as an idea in our heads 
or a sentiment in our hearts, but work out its implications in every detail of our lives. That means we will not compare ourselves with each other as if one of us were better and another worse. We have far more interesting things to do with our lives. Each of us is an original. And that's from Galatians 5 in the message. So I invite you to know your own unique original self. Will you let go of your finite view of yourself and open to a far greater vision of who you truly are? Let's pray. Lord, you have searched us and you know us. You know when we sit and when we rise. You perceive our thoughts from afar. You discern our going out and our lying down. You are familiar with all of our ways. I praise you because we are each fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. 